And so today we're going to uh, uh, talk about designing, implementing, and using reactive APIs. Um, this session is going to be a little bit different than all of the other sessions you've heard um, so far this week. And primarily that's because unlike um, all of the other presenters who are inventing these products and making them incredibly flexible for you to use in any way that you see fit, we have very strong opinions on the way that you should use reactive technologies. And this comes from the work that we've been doing over the last, um, God, it's almost been a year now, in fact, uh, working with the Reactor team, working with the Cloud Foundry team, and actually putting together a reactive API, possibly the first one um, that we're going to release as part of um, the Spring Cloud Foundry Pivotal family. So, a little bit of background. Uh, my name is Ben Hale. Um, I am the lead of the Cloud Foundry Java Experience, which is a very, um, I don't know, boastful title, something like that. Uh, but basically what this means is that I sit at the intersection between all of you Spring and Java users and all of you Cloud Foundry users. My job on a daily basis is to make sure that running Java applications on top of Cloud Foundry is really, really easy to do. Among the other things um, that I'm responsible for, I actually run the team that creates the Cloud Foundry Java client. The Cloud Foundry Java client is a language binding on top of um, Cloud Foundry itself. And what we're going to talk about this week, or this particular session, is how we did this, how we designed it, how we implemented it, and how we used it. Um, but before we, we go into that, let me also introduce Paul Harris. Uh, go ahead and introduce. Hi. Uh, my name is Paul Harris. I am a, a developer on the CF Java client project, the one that we're going to be mentioning here. Uh, most of my career in IT, I've been a tester. About two years ago, I moved over to the dark side and have become a, a Java developer. <laughs> uh, going OK so far, I think. Good. Good. So the first slide we have here is quite possibly the most hilariously titled slide I've ever created. Introduction to reactive programming. You guys get five bullet points for that introduction. Um, and clearly, it is much, much more complicated than that. But you've been hearing a lot about reactive programming, whether it's in the keynotes or whether you're hearing um, Stefan and his cohorts talk about it. But broadly, what we're doing is we're defining what you might call event-driven systems. Even in places where you don't think about systems being event-driven, we are sort of decomposing them very, very, to down to a very, very low level where there are events driving certain behaviors. Um, and it moves what we, can, what we are very, very familiar, imperative logic, and it moves it into traditionally asynchronous, non-blocking, and even functionally styled code. And to be clear, this is by no means a requirement to moving to a reactive style. However, these are some of the things that are enabled by using a reactive style of programming, and we find that they come incredibly useful um, in when you have chosen to do it. The Fundamental point, though, the reason you choose reactive programming over an imperative style is that it gives you stable, scalable access. Not necessarily a performance gain, although that can potentially happen. But what we're talking about is using resources more efficiently, and most importantly, in the face of overwhelming load, being able to stay alive, to behave well, if not perfectly. But the big key is we want to get into a situation that at the edges of what we can do, at the limits of our application, we want to make sure that the application does not fall over. It's, it's bounded in some way. And so, as I said before, we're working on something called the Cloud Foundry Java Client. And you guys have heard a ton about Cloud Foundry this week, um, possibly more than you actually wanted to. But suffice to say, uh, it's my job, so I'm glad you guys have been exposed to it a bit. And Cloud Foundry does a bunch of things. But what's most interesting to us is that Cloud Foundry is actually composed of a bunch of RESTful APIs, hundreds and hundreds. I believe uh, we are sort of targeting about 550 different REST endpoints with enormous payloads, all secured by OAuth, um, huge JSON serialization uh, and deserialization issues going on in there. But the key is that while we, we have these things, we want to be able to make it very, very easy for Java developers to consume this API. The APIs themselves, though, are very, very, very low level, um, super primitive. Like, if you think of what you've seen on stage about Cloud Foundry doing a CF push, uh, Paul especially can tell you, CF push is actually like a dozen different REST calls and some waiting around and polling to find out when things are finished. It's really, really complicated to do. But even in the face of all of this, Java has become the preferred language for orchestrating Cloud Foundry. Um, part of this is simply because 
the sheer number of Java users on top of Cloud Foundry, the sheer numbers of enterprises that are trying to orchestrate Cloud Foundry that are already Java shops. But it turns out that this kind of orchestration is really, really difficult when you're working against something like a generic API. So you might say something like this, where if you take a look at the payloads, there's just a bunch of strings, right? It's just JSON maps effectively. And making sure that you've got exactly the right underscores and exactly the right camel case and uh, uh, hyphens in the right place, and you know that the type that's going to be coming out should be a list and not a map, or it's a string and not a Boolean. All of this stuff is really, really complicated to get right. So what we want to do with the Cloud Foundry Java client is basically put a strongly typed language binding sitting on top of it, telling you what is required, what is optional, exactly what the typing should be, things like that. And it turns out that it makes using this API and orchestrating this API significantly easier for Java developers. So, we're actually working on version 2.0 of the Java client. It will go um, probably RC either tomorrow or early next week, and it will get released sort of in line with um, the Reactor release as well. And internally, we have a lot of projects that are starting to build on top of that, whether it's the STS um, IDE or the Cloud Foundry Dataflow project, which is deploying um, applications onto Cloud Foundry instances. But when we sort of took a step back and decided to start on the Cloud Foundry, or sorry, on the Java Client 2.0 effort, we had a choice to make, right? We could have sort of done it in the same old imperative way, but we saw with the advent of Java 8, all of a sudden this ability for us to say, hmm, maybe Reactive is right. Maybe this is the time that we can make this shift. And we ended up saying, yes, absolutely we should do this. And the reason is because the fact that it's a network interaction, the entire thing is based on the premise that we are going to make a request and then we're going to wait around and we're going to get a response back from that. That really encouraged us to do an asynchronous and highly concurrent design, right? We want to be able to make it so that people can do massive numbers of things in parallel very, very easy. Um, and so one of the other things that this allowed us to do is get in really, really early with Project Reactor, with Stefan. He and I um, have spent way, way, way too many hours on Screen Hero with one another. It's amazing. It turns out you can pair even when one of you lives in London and one of you lives in San Francisco, as long as one of you is willing to stay up until one in the morning. Um, but it's really great because it meant that when Stefan had an idea of how he thought something should work, we were sitting right there and we could implement his idea and tell him if it worked the way he wanted to. Or he'd take a look and he'd see the way that we were actually using his APIs and how they were behaving in the face of that and what was useful to us, what APIs we needed to be able to create something like this. And so over the last six months, or a year even, um, both Project Reactor and the CF Java client have evolved together, even to the point where some mornings I would wake up and at 6.05 a.m. I would have to coordinate him creating a snapshot and us making a change to consume that snapshot so that nobody's CI broke kind of thing. Um, we were right there with it, and it's been super rewarding for us, and I hope you guys feel the same way using Reactor 3.0 when it comes out. So we're gonna take a look now um, at the three components that we describe in the titles. What does it mean to design a Reactive API? And I know when I started with Reactor and with Reactive um, design, it was immensely confusing to me. And not like, oh, what operator should I use here? What does the AMB operator actually mean? But even more primitively than that. So we're gonna start at a very, very low level. And maybe some of this stuff you already know, but I guarantee a lot of you don't. <clears throat> So when do we use a reactive design? I said we chose it because our sort of network API, which is what we were talking about, really fits in well. But fundamentally, why does a networking API work well with reactive design? And that's because it deals with a lot of things that cause problems in highly scalable system. What happens when I have to make a call to the Cloud Foundry Cloud Controller and it takes 200 milliseconds? or 2,000 milliseconds potentially to respond, right? What should happen on the client side of that connection, right? Should I be blocking a thread open? No. What happens in the face of the expected network failures? Do I need to have try-catch blocks all over my code? Or is it simply um, an expectation that errors might happen and we should always be handling errors as part of the standard behavior of our, our, our client? And even better than that, 
this idea of given the fact that there is huge amounts of data streaming across this network connection, how do we sort of slow things down a bit? How do we say that the client's application that requested a list of all of the users in the entire Cloud Foundry install might not be able to handle them all immediately? How do we provide a little bit of back pressure to make sure that in the face of millions of these records coming back, we don't fall over with an out of memory exception? We also want to make sure that in the case where we want to do highly concurrent operations, that we have the best possible performance and the easiest programming model. I'll be the first to admit the reactive programming model is not as easy to understand, especially initially, as an imperative programming model. However, when it comes time to actually coordinate massively parallel operations or sequential then to parallel, back to sequential, so basically fork join kind of behaviors, it does actually really become a heck of a lot easier to understand. And we have a lot of users that want to do this. So a great example here is um, inside of Cloud Foundry, there's something called um, uh, route services. And so every single request that comes into a particular application or on a particular domain can be routed to another application to make some decision. And maybe this decision is, should I be allowed to actually um, service this request? You can basically put authentication and authorization in front of it. And maybe you're routing that authentication and authorization into Cloud Foundry's UAA component, the user authentication and authorization, maybe that's what it's called, um, component. Because you are servicing thousands and thousands of requests per second, the application that is doing this authentication and authorization also needs to be able to handle that exact same number, possibly even more if you're rejecting a lot of requests. And so it needs to be able to behave in a highly efficient, highly concurrent way and obviously to handle that level of scalability. So once you've made the decision that my API is appropriate for using a reactive um, design, we start with what are the basic primitive building blocks? What should my API expose to users? And fundamentally, in the case of Reactor, which is what we're gonna focus on today, it's two things, a flux and a mono. And both of these things do implement the publisher interface, so they are interoperable with other reactive streams um, compatible uh, libraries. But fundamentally, what we're saying is flux is a way to say we're going to have zero to n values, mono, zero to one. And the Java client is almost exclusively monos, because it turns out that we have one request maps to one response almost everywhere. Uh, we could have re, um, uh, we could have rendered that same idea as fluxes. It only returned one thing. But the mono is a very strong type that tells users what they need to expect. You're either going to get a response or you're not going to get a response. You're never going to get five responses, except in places where that is actually true. So if we take a look at some code here, we see that um, listing applications uh, is basically a flux of applications coming back. And we can do things with that particular flux of applications. We can say, OK, given a list of applications, we can map that to an app, a set of application names. It basically says, like, we don't know how many applications are going to be coming out of the system. It could be zero, it could be 1,000, whatever. And I want you to behave the same way on each one of them. And then when you subscribe to that, in this case, we're basically just printing the list of the usernames that we've mapped back out. Our subscribe method, the, the consume argument on it, uh, basically allows you to, uh, or is basically called repeatedly with each individual element. You don't have to iterate over it yourself. You don't have to deal with the fact that there might be zero, because you'll never be called in the case that there's zero. The next one is mono. And mono is a bit different. As you can see in this case, we're listing the exact same number of applications. But because we don't want to sort of be handled, handed an, an arbitrary number of names, we might collect those into a list. And when we collect those into a list, it then becomes a mono. We've basically said, here was a stream of things. We didn't know how many there were. But once we had all of them, we transferred them into a list. And now that list, you're either going to get a list or you're not going to get a list at the end of it. And then you can do things like asking that single object um, for some value. Does um, this collection of names actually contain something else? And so we talk about those being the two most common types, and obviously the generic, so you can put sort of payloads. You could have a 
flux of lists of strings or something like that if you wanted to. That's somewhat common as well. But the key is that those are the only two things you're ever likely to return. Because unlike imperative APIs, void is not an option. Right? Um, it is not appropriate for you to ever say anything, uh, uh, say a method doesn't return something. Because as weird as this sounds, a reactive flow like this doesn't do anything up until someone subscribes to it. So one of the, the big conceptual differences, when I see this code on here, I assume nothing has ever happened. I basically built a structure and said, when you want something to happen, you should subscribe to this. Here is a recipe to get the data you want, but the data isn't coming until you ask for it. And that's really, really key, because it basically allows you to create this incredibly complex structure without the penalty at that point, or perhaps ever, of actually running any data through it. So because subscription must happen to trigger any sort of behavior, consumers must subscribe to that flux or mono which means you must always return a flux or a mono. So the, the, the example that we're talking about is something like this. In imperative operation, it's super common to have a blocking behavior like deleting. We want to go back and we want to call delete on some REST template. Once the, the request goes out, it will block until a request comes back and says, yes, we're all done, which means that not only has the delete method blocked open, but the main method has blocked open as well. But that's not good enough, right? And a reactive example, we need to actually return a mono because uh, if we take a look at the main method, we've said delete test ID. And while we see that that basically returns a mono that has a delete behavior in it, no call has ever been made. We haven't actually executed it. No request has been sent across the wire until the line where we actually do a subscription. And at that point, we're going to see a request get done and a response come back, and we wait around for that response to happen. And so that's a, a key difference here is you, you're, you become so used to reading code top to bottom saying, oh, and this executed, and then this will execute, and then this executes. And now when you switch into this reactive paradigm, what you say is, when somebody finally subscribes, and I don't know where in the code that is, this will execute. And so now all of a sudden you've got methods that aren't executed quite when you think they are. But again, it's sort of a, a mind shift as you take a look and read code like this. Now, you're also seeing that the methods that we write, um, and we'll see this a lot more as we go through the examples, are actually quite small. And so we said a little bit earlier that uh, reactive programming lends itself to functional programming as well. Inputs return outputs. And generally, we also attempt to, to the best of our ability, to make those methods very, very small. Uh, and I know, because we are all good imperative programmers as well, that we always have very small, tightly cohesive methods that don't do a million things. They only do a handful of very, very small things. We have just littered, you know, our, our, met our, our classes are just littered with private methods. I've, uh, um, when I moved over onto the Cloud Foundry Java Experience team, I basically spent three years as a Ruby developer, um, in addition to my, my, uh, my Java responsibilities. Um, and one of the things that being in that community taught me is it is perfectly OK to introduce a one-line method that does nothing but change the name so that the name is more understandable. And I think that's something that maybe Java developers have lost track of, is this very small, very well-named um, uh, design that allows you to compose things quite well. We want to make these methods much more reusable than they already were. We're basically generating functions. That's what our goal is in this kind of design. And so functions have an input, have an output, have no side effects. That makes them so much more reusable than methods we traditionally write in imperative. And I see um, Jurgen sitting over here in the audience. I'm not sure that necessarily applies to him. He writes good <laughs> methods at all times. But the rest of us um, are, uh, are, are prone to writing methods that aren't quite as reusable as they might be. So one of the great things about making methods like this, um, these, these highly reusable methods, is that we can use them in many different ways. We can use them in parallel. We can use them in sequential. And so this is possibly one of the most complex examples we see inside of our code base. And so we have a method here that says, given a page number, what we're, what we're attempting to do here is request a paginated group uh, or sorry, make a paginated request to the server to get between one and n pages to get a complete list of resources from it. 
And so what we've done is we've written a reusable method. We don't know what page number we're trying to get, but every time we do it, we want to call list applications passing in this particular page number. And so what this means then is that we can say get page one, which gives us the very first one, and then sequentially pull out what the total number of pages are out of that. And then in parallel, using the exact same method, since there was no side effect to the original get page method, we can now call it, but it, we can now call it with two, three, four, five, ten, one thousand, and we can do it all in parallel with one another and return from there. We, because we wrote a method that didn't know whether it was being called in, in、uh, series or in parallel, we allowed ourselves to use it in both possible ways. Okay? So we're going to flip on to、um, some of the implementations of these designs that we've seen. I'm going to let Paul take over from here. Thanks, Ben. So,、um, Ben's already talked about the design. Um, I'm going to talk about the implementation and、um, the using. This isn't a, a handbook on how to do all of this. It's just some of the things that we've, we've observed as we've been、um, developing the system.、Um, hopefully, you'll find some of it useful.、Um, so, the first thing is sequential and parallel coordination. So, at the moment,、um, processor speed seems to be topping out.、Um, Intel and all the other manufacturers are concentrating on cramming more and more cores onto the chip. So, Um, it's not too bold a statement to say that all significant performance improvements come from concurrency. We need to be able to do more at the same time, not just do it faster. Unfortunately, concurrency is very hard to do properly, as I'm sure you're aware. There's a lot of coordination that needs to happen,、um, making th sure things happen in the right order. The good news is that reactive frameworks, such as、um, Project Reactor, allow you、um, to define these sequential and parallel relationships, and then it takes care of the hard work of making sure that all of these things are coordinated. So, if I've got three things that all can all happen together and then they all need to feed into a single、um, sequential operation, it will take care of that for me. So, if we have a look at a little bit of a code, hopefully this will look a little familiar because it's the one that Ben just showed.、Um, as he was saying, what we do here is we get a single page、um, as a request, and we,、uh, one of the pieces of information that that single page will contain is、uh, the number of total pages that we're going to get back. Um, and let's say, for example, that we, it tells us that we've got 10 pages back. So, so far, we've done one sequential operation, give me one page. We can then make a request to say,、um, I would like the next nine pages, the entire payload.、Um, and Reactor will make sure that all of that happens in、um, parallel. So, we get、um, nine requests going on at the same time, bringing back all of this data for when we're ready for it.、Um, the big benefit there is that. Um, instead of having 10 se、um, sequential、uh, reads and、uh, 10, 10 sequential requests and responses, we've managed to do、um, nine of them at the same time. So, whilst、uh, Stefan in his presentations yesterday was very keen to stress that this is not about performance, this is about stability,、um, you can actually get some performance out of it as well. One of the other things that naturally you want to be doing is、um, making decisions. And there are various ways that、uh, Reactor will let you do that.、Um, so, looking at、uh, conditional logic, one, one of the oddities of Reactor when you first start to use it is that an exception is a value the same as any other. So,、um, we don't automatically blow up when we see an exception. Generally speaking, it gets passed through the flow onto the next person in line.、Um, you can tell I'm a fairly new developer. I keep talking about people. I know that there aren't actually people consuming all of this.、Um, So, once this exception passes down, we can decide to do something. We could decide just to pass it on. This is a genuine error. I don't know what happened. Here you go. You, you need to work out what to do with it. Or we can decide actually that's a legitimate error. I was expecting that.、Um, and I'll need to do something with it that's meaningful within my application. So, if we take a look at an example of that,、um, what we have here is、uh, we're doing a get application request. So, we start off at the top with a get app request. And it contains、um, some information. And the thing that we're particularly interested in here is an application ID. We can use that to get some information about an application. Specifically, we're going to look at client application statistics. So, this is going to tell us things like、um, uptime and CPU usage, that kind of thing. And hopefully, the application will respond correctly.、Um, we've built our little request, we make the request to the statistics endpoint, and it will return an, a mono of AppStats response. 
You can see that up on the top line there. But sometimes it won't provide the correct response. Um, and the one common e uh, example of it doing that is if the application is stopped. Clearly, if the application is stopped, it can't tell you about its uptime or its CPU uh, usage. So in that case, this is a perfectly normal thing that we would expect to get back from Cloud Foundry. Nothing has gone wrong. We want to be able to handle that error. And we do that by using dot otherwise, which is uh, one of the methods that appears on a mono. We expect a particular error. That's the app stopped error. We consume it. And we say, given that error, I'll take it. I'll actually discard the error itself. I don't particularly care about its content. I'm just going to return an empty app stats response. So in both circumstances, whether I got a good response back or I got nothing back, or I got an error back, should I say, then I'm able to return an app stats response. And whoever's consuming me can, can continue about their business. So that's error conditions. Another example of um, conditional logic that we want to operate on is if we get uh, nothing back. So if we get a completion without any value that's in it. This is similar to returning a null in an imperative API, except um, in reactive APIs, you can't have null. It's part of the contract, not allowed. Just as we were looking with the error conditions, we can pass this um, empty completion on. Uh, we might decide to do something with it. We might um, convert it into something else. We might take another action based on it. So if you look at an example of this, first example is a flux. Fairly simple um, example. It contains, it, we're doing a get domains request. So we're, we're asking for a num an unknown number of domains. Um, and in Cloud Foundry, there's this little oddity that there are two types of domains. You can have a private domain, which is unique to an organization. We can have a shared domain that is available to everybody. The trick is that given an ID, we don't know whether that's a private domain or a shared domain. So we have to do a little query. And in this code, we start off by saying, I've got my ID. I'll do a request private domains. So a nice little snippet of code that says, go and query Cloud Foundry and say, give me the private domain that matches with this ID. Hopefully, that will come back and give me a get domains response, which I can send on to whoever's consuming me. But sometimes it will return complete. It said, I looked. There was nothing there. Everything's fine, but I don't have any value to give you. When that happens, I use a switch if empty by saying, if I get an empty result back, so it's come back to me OK, but there's nothing there, then what I want you to do is the following line of code, request a shared domain. And again, Nice little snippet of code that's off somewhere doing um, a nice reusable unit of code, as it were, um, that will take the ID and hopefully then return a get domains response. So that's a flux example. We can also do a mono example. This is slightly more complicated. Um, so again, we're after a domain ID. We've got a get domain re ID request. And I'm going to start off in basically the same way a get pro private domain ID. So I'm after, after a particular string reference here. The difference here is that I'm uh, supply, supplying a name. So I don't actually know if this domain exists at all. It's not a, a well-established ID. It's just something you've typed in. So I query get private domain ID. Hopefully, that will return an ID, and I, we can turn that, I can return that as a mono string. But it may return nothing. It might say, I looked, didn't find anything. Here you go. In which case, I'm then going to otherwise if empty. I'm going to say, OK, I got this response. It's empty, so I will try my shared domain. And again, I do the same sort of request. Hopefully, that will come back with an ID. But again, it may not, in which case, it provides an empty completion. And I do another otherwise if empty. But this time, instead of saying, um, here's the value, try another value, I'm going to throw an exception. And I'm going to say, the domain name that you provided for me does not exist. So two simple examples of conditional logic. That will cover some things, but clearly there is a lot more that we can do with conditional logic. Um, so you want to make decisions based not on errors or on whether something just completed, but you've actually got values floating around that you want to make use of. Um, you can do that in Reactor. It's um, not necessarily the way that you want to do it. One of the other points that I took away from, uh, Stefan's, points, uh, from Stefan's presentations yesterday is that uh, Reactor is a hammer, but not everything's a nail. So you don't have to do everything in Reactor. In that case, it's possible to use imperative conditional statements instead. So here's some code. It compiles. 
I'm not promising that it actually works, because we don't do it like this. Uh, so don't run any power stations based on this. Um, but it's, again, building on this get domain uh, idea that we've been looking at. I have a domain. The first thing I need to do is convert it into um, a mono. I need to get reactive with this string that I've got. And then I do a filter. And I say, filter all the things that are null. And I will now do something with those results. I do a then get shared domain, so I try and retrieve a shared domain. If that doesn't work, I try the private domain, take a value out of it, and possibly just throw a illegal state exception if I can't find anything. Then I have an otherwise if empty. Now, this otherwise if empty applies to the filter. And it's saying, if you didn't get any results out of that, so if um, domain was actually not null, then I want you to do this piece of processing. And again, same pattern, private domain, shared domain, exception if we can't find anything. That works, but I prefer this. I've got a nice, understandable if something else, something else. So it looks very familiar to us. The key thing about it, though, is that it is still reactive. Whilst I've got a little bit of imperative logic in there, the thing that I return is still a mono string. You can see that from the top line. So I've not broken my model. I've not suddenly switched everything into imperative mode. But I have the nice legibility. If you go back to the, the imperative example for a moment, that's just an if then else. If you imagine some sort of switch, you know, Java imperative switch statement, you can imagine that this is going to stack up and up. If we hadn't um, decomposed everything, in, oh, composed everything into um, nice get shared domain ID and so on, you can imagine that you're going to have to have wads of paper out just trying to track whose otherwise if empty there is. This is so much easier just to use the. Um, conditional logic uh, out of imperative Java. So one of the other things we want to do is testing, obviously. Um, I've made a bold statement here that most useful flows will be asynchronous. It's not as bold as it actually sounds. If you've got this far, if you've decided that reactive is the thing for your application, then generally speaking, most of the stuff that you'll be doing will have this asynchronous element, and you want to be able to allow for it. If that's not the case, then probably you should be using Java 8 streams, something like that. So the problem that we have is that we're in an asynchronous mindset, but um, testing frameworks such as JUnit are aggressively synchronous. They want to get things done as soon as they can, main thread, get it done. So we need to allow for that. And the way we allow for that is by blocking the main thread and making uh, test assertions on the asynchronous thread. We'll take a look at that. A nice, simple, naive example. We create a mono, and it's just a string, nice and straightforward. Uh, we subscribe to it on a thread, and we make an assertion. We say that the result of this should be Bravo. And happily, it passes, except it wasn't actually supposed to pass because we started with Alpha, and now we've got Bravo. So whilst that looks OK, actually, that's not what we were hoping for. So what we need to do is take some responsibility for making sure that everything has completed when we're doing our test. And we can do that using a countdown latch. So we're doing the same basic test here. We're going to have um, a mono of alpha, and we're going to make sure that it asserts equal to Bravo. The difference is that we're setting up a catch. Uh, there's one or two other details around here that you don't need to be particularly concerned with. But uh, the key point is that down at the end, we have a latch await. So whatever else happens, this, um, uh, this code is going to wait for the latch to be released. And that's what we do on that subscribe line. We say, once actual has been set with the, result of the, uh, with the input from this uh, mono, then we will release the latch. And you can then do your test. And happily, we've got an exclamation mark. That should have run, shouldn't it? <laughs> it did. <laughs> and that's green, <clears throat> honestly. <laughs> so we can do that. And um, we'll see later on a bit more about using countdown matches. But um, it's kind of clumsy to keep remembering to do that every time. You will forget, um, and your test will appear to pass. And actually, it never actually did the test. So an easy way of dealing with that problem is to actually create a custom or a, a deliberate test subscriber rather than just a, a generic one. Whilst we're making a test subscriber, we can put the countdown latch stuff in there, but we can also do other things with it. 
So we can have it make multiple value assertions because we're not generally just dealing with a single value coming in. Um, we can expect errors. So sometimes, as we've said, error is a perfectly reasonable thing to come down. We want to be able to deal with that. And we want to be able to cope with unexpected errors. We don't want to blow up or do anything else. We just want to be able to report your test tried and it failed, and here's why. Um, so by creating a test subscriber, we can include all of that and get some much more straightforward code. So what we have here, uh, we've made it a little more tricky as a test. We've got a flux coming in, but only with two values. Uh, we're going to subscribe to it on a thread. Um, and then we have a test subscriber that makes a couple of assertions. It says, um, we expect a value of alpha and a value of bravo. And then, right at the end, test subscriber verify with a delay. You're still at risk of forgetting something, but the only thing you can really forget here is that at the end, you have to actually do the verify, which is the thing that kicks off the entire process and says, yes, I want to actually get a value here. But we've not had to worry about countdown latches. We've not had to worry about getting in multiple values and how we're going to work out which is which. Um, it also gives you greater opportunity to expand out the amount of testing that you do. So here we have um, assert equals, but we can do all sorts of complex things. We have assert that, and then we can have multiple line things checking out different parameters from a particular return type. So very useful to do. Um, you'll see it passed. This one actually passed as well. Um, there is a built-in uh, test subscriber within, the, uh, within Reactor, um, which is fine. You can use that, no problem. Uh, we decided to create our own that provides us with additional benefits. If you want to know exactly why, then Ben can talk for hours about that, so you should see him afterwards. Um, but the, source is open, uh, the code is open source. It's up on GitHub. You can take a look, take some inspiration from it, take huge copy and paste inspiration from it if that's what you need. Um, well worth a look. So we'll move on to using um, Reactive now and using a Reactive API. We come back to the countdown latches again. Um, so Reactive frameworks can only coordinate their own operations. So they're operating within an execution environment, and the execution environment has got its own concerns and doing its own thing that Reactor is, is not a part of. Um, fortunately, Reactor can cope quite nicely here um, because um, it deals with the fact that execution environments will be terminating processes, will be killing things um, before. Yeah, I'm not explaining that very well. Do you want to step in for a second, sure. Ben? Yeah. yeah, you do this. Uh, to jump in for this one. Yeah. Um, Reactor uh, plays quite nicely in execution environments that are basically long-lived, where processes outlive threads. And the canonical example of this is obviously a servlet container. Tomcat will stay up forever, right, regardless of what the threads are doing inside, which means that if you have Reactor doing things asynchronously, coordinating threads behind the scenes to do its work, well, it doesn't really have to worry about the fact that the process might die early. A lot of the stuff we saw about the countdown latch early, earlier was all about managing the fact that the process will die or um, JUnit will consider the test to be done long before Reactor gets around to doing any actual work. So most of the time that you'd use something like the CF Java client, you're going to be fine. You're operating in an environment where Reactor plays very, very nicely. But there are other scenarios, things like Java main methods, things like JUnit tests. Okay. So what Ben said. Um, <laughs> so here we have an example um, where we've got some code that's going to finish before we subscribe. So we set up a mono, again, just going to emit an alpha. Um, we're going to delay the subscription. So when we subscribe, we're actually going to wait a second before we actually um, complete this subscription by, hopefully, sysouting the value that we got. And when we run that, we find that it completes successfully. Everything ran. There were no problems. But we didn't get the alpha that we were expecting to have printed out, because it's already completed the entire process before the subscription could actually say, yeah, I've waited a second. Now I would like to do my printout. So instead of that, we want something that will wait. And again, we're using the countdown latch that we saw in the test subscriber. Um, we're going to do the same mono alpha. We're going to subscribe. We're going to wait for a second. But again, we have this latch await at the end. So nothing can ultimately complete until that latch has been decremented and we know the process is completed. 
If you look at the um, line subscribe, again, we're going to try and do a sysout. And the key thing here is that we have two other parameters. We have um, a T, latch countdown, and a latch countdown. What's that saying is that uh, the final parameter is saying, if I complete successfully, then uh, release the latch, we're good, everything can carry on. But what that middle parameter is saying is, there might be an error. And because we know that errors are normal things in um, Reactor, that could just pass through normally and would appear to have uh, run the test and everything would be fine. But actually, we want to, throw, uh, we want to deal with that by saying, we need to decrement our counter, uh, our latch, rather. So we know that something has actually happened. There is no finally block involved here. We have to take care of it. And if we run that, we find that the process still completes successfully, but it actually also prints out the sysout that we were hoping for. Blocking flows. So it's very common to try and bridge between imperative and reactive APIs. Naturally, at the moment, that's going to be particularly common because we're one of the very few reactive APIs. Um, in that case, blocking is OK. Um, and I hesitate when I say it because I'm, I'm going to explain why, in a way, it's not OK in a moment. Um, the key thing here is that we can make um, any reactive API imperative, because we can always just do a block on it. But once you've gone imperative, you can't go back. So we can't suddenly put things back into a reactive mode, because there's going to be blocking out there, and that's just going to mess everything up. Um, so here we have um, a simple mono example. We have request user, which is um, doing something and, and getting a user back. Uh, and then we're overriding an external method that says, um, I want to request user. And it is expecting a single name, or a single user, rather. Um, we do a request. We call that a request user. We've actually got a typo there, never mind. Um, and we block on that. Okay, So we're going to wait until we get the value back that we can then return, because the imperative interface that we're trying to deal with here expects a single value back. A flux example, very similar. We have request users, which is going to return a flux for us. Um, so then we have, we're overriding list users. We're going to call that request users, which will give us a flux. We're going to go collect all the values in together into a list. And we're going to block until we've got all of the values back that we can then pass on. Yeah? So, so the question is, why wouldn't you just use block in JUnit? Um, you absolutely can. But uh, <laughs> Paul's going to give you um, a rule of thumb here that yeah. I think will answer the question for you. Um, so. Block, originally, when uh, Stefan was creating the, the very beginnings of version 3, was called get. And you would just do a got, dot get when you wanted to get something. And dot get is actually quite friendly. And um, you think, oh, yeah, I, I, I want to get this value, so I'll use dot get. And we found in the tests that it took us quite a long time to break the habit of saying halfway through a flow or just somewhere in the middle, we'd, we'd put a got, dot get because I need this value, and then I can pass it on. And in the test, yeah, that's fine. You, you're not, you know there's not going to be great load. It's, it's just going to resolve nice and easily. But you get into that habit, and then it's bad, because you then start to use that in actual production code. So for test, it, it doesn't particularly matter. But don't do it, because you're, you're going to fall into that trap of using it everywhere. Yeah. So that, Sorry, go ahead. So that's one of the reasons why Stefan changed it to be dot .block. Dot .get, nice and friendly. Dot .block, this is a bad thing. You want to think carefully, because blocking is bad, right? Um, the follow-on from that as well is that um, it's not just a case of if you're in the middle of a flow and you, you've got this urge to type dot .block, you should try and fight it. You actually want to push that dot .block out to the furthest point in your code. So keep as much on the inside, reactive as you possibly can. And it's only when you start to interact with an external system that is imperative that you say, yeah, OK, I'm going to upset Stefan now. I will type dot .block. Yeah, it, it comes down to habits, fundamentally. And the reason why we would introduce a test subscriber is we want to have the habit that every time we write reactive code, it is completely non-blocking. And to know that only in hyper-specific circumstances. 
Only in very, very critical cases would we ever switch out of a non-blocking behavior into a blocking behavior because fundamentally it is so crippling to what you are attempting to do. What you are trying to gain is just gone at that point. Wherever that boundary is, you get no more of the advantages that you would have gotten from reactive. And so put it off as long as possible and get into the habit of like, oh man, I just typed block. Something is important right here. <laughs> Not every single test I wrote, so half of the code I wrote or two thirds of the code I've written are, is, uses block. Exactly, yeah, exactly. It, it really was striking um, to me at least that just the urge to type .get at the time was just overwhelming because, because if you do that, you don't have to think reactively and what you want to do is think reactively. So as we mentioned before, um, error handling is not something that happens accidentally. It's something that we actually need to do because errors are values the same as everything else. Subscriber that we've seen a few examples of has between zero and three parameters. And one of those parameters is to allow for error handling. Um, and again, we use countdown latches to make sure that we are coping with these errors. So um, hopefully this sort of code is looking pretty familiar to you by now. This is a flux example. So um, we're making things just a little bit trickier. We have um, two elements in this flux. We have an alpha, a mono just of alpha. So it's a, a string of alpha that's coming in as a mono. But we also have a mono of an error of illegal state exception. Again, um, exceptions are just values the same as any others. So you can, you can create a new flux that contains an error and a string and a list and anything else you want. We subscribe to that. Um, we consume it, that's the first parameter, so system out, print line. We, take, uh, we specify an action that we're going to take if there's an error, so we take T, the throwable that might be emitted, and we say, I want to print the stack trace from that, and then I want to decrement my latch. Or, um, and we also provide a complete step, so if everything works normally, I still need to release my latch, so that when I get to latch await at the end, it knows that everything's good, we're all finished, everybody's on the same thread, we're happy. Key thing there is that um, error and complete are different things. Complete doesn't mean I'll do everything for you. It, it is not definely. You have to provide an error, you have to provide a complete step, otherwise you're gonna miss something. Composable method references. This is something that Ben mentioned a little bit earlier on. Um, we don't want to be involved in callback hell. We want to be able to use methods again and again, small discrete pieces of code that we can keep reusing. One of the things that we found is that anytime we were um, making a call out to the API directly, we would call it request something. So we knew that there was a request being made. If we then took the result of that and buried it in something else, so we wanted to extract a piece of data, we'd use something like get or list based on that. So we, we always knew what it was that we were using. Um, a very important thing for this is that um, if you pick good method names and good syntax, then you get very readable flows. You can sometimes get in a position where you need to make quite a long flow. And um, this one's not terrible, but you know, there's, there's four steps involved here. Um, if you imagine this kind of a flow without all these um, method references in, then you could all automatically imagine that it's going to get a lot longer, a lot less readable. So in this example, we start with, um, because it's uh, reactive, we need to start with something reactive. So we create a mono, and we put two elements in it. We put um, a Cloud Foundry client and a space ID, just two values. Then we call a request space summary using those values. We take the, um, the space summary that comes out of that, and we extract the applications. So it contains some number of application details in there. Um, we create a flux out of that, and then we map that to an application summary, which you can see from the top line is what we're actually trying to return from here. Now, I'm assuming that most of you don't know a great deal about Cloud Foundry. You don't know anything about um, Java Client particularly. And yet, you, I think you can see that that's actually quite a readable flow. You can understand what's going in there. You don't need to know a lot of expertise there. So by breaking things down into these small discrete units, it makes the code a lot easier to read, to debug, keeps it nice and compact. One final thing that you may have noticed in um, what we've been doing is that we're using something called point-free style, so very compact style. 
Um, there's a link there that you can follow for all of the Haskell goodness that will explain that to you. The reason we're doing that, th there's two reasons. One is that it helps us think at a higher level about the functions that we're creating. I don't really want to be involved in what the requests are. I just want to know I um, request uh, domain I ID or whatever it might be. Um, the other thing is that um, it keeps the code nice and compact, as I've been mentioning. It, it makes things nice and readable. Um, some of you will be looking at the code that we've been using, and here's an example of this, and thinking, yeah, I'm not sure that I agree with that. I, I don't find that very readable. I understand that. I think most of us on the project started out that way. And what we found over time that it just seems to be part of the way of doing Reactor, and, and, and eventually you get used to it, and it actually makes sense, as well as having these benefits. It's readable, and it actually works well. So if I look at this, um, okay. one second, calm down. Um, if we look at this example, um, we've got a couple of builder methods here. The first one is list applications request, and then lower down we have um, a delete applications request. Now you can imagine that with the first one, I could um, start by creating that builder um, before I even do the return pagination utils, et cetera, and then just put in that request object um, in line in my code. But when you get down to the second one, I can't do that in advance because I'm waiting for this application ID to be emitted. So I have to wait for that to turn up. I can still do it in line. I can start putting in squiggly brackets and arrows and all sorts of things. But it, it looks horrible. It's not as readable and not as elegant. So by using the point free style, some of you will react against it. But it's well worth having a try. OK, with that, I'm going to hand back to um, Ben. Yeah, I want to jump in and say that, that that choice of point free style that we are now on was easily the most contentious thing <laughs> over the course of the year in our project. And to, to be honest, I was totally against it. Um, I continued using code reviews to force the team to not use point free style for quite a long time. And as penance for my eventual change and my today absolute love and advocacy for a point free style, I had to go back and change 4,000 different uh, requests <laughs> to make sure that they were all point free now. And I, I genuinely understand anybody who looks at that and goes, holy cow, that is so dense. I just, I cannot read it. But there's all sorts of IDE help like, um, in IntelliJ, like command up will start expanding out. So like if it's a little bit complicated and you don't exactly understand where the parentheses are and stuff like that, IDE help gets you out there as well. And eventually it sort of becomes habitual. We, we link to the, the Haskell article on it, which um, at least explains it, uh, but actually might alienate you slightly more um, <laughs> once you've seen it, mostly because it's full of Haskell, uh, which is a giant, um, yeah not great thing to read. But the concepts in there, this idea that there is no assignment traditionally, is effectively what we're talking about is you don't, do, you don't assign a variable just so that you can reuse it later. You inline it in place. And again, there is a lot of danger of doing these things that are nested 17 deep using point free style. And so we advocate definitely breaking it back out, using those well-named private methods, things like that. Definitely going to help you there. There is no. There is no magic bullet. Certainly, point free is not the magic bullet for dealing with um, reactive flows that are just too complex. You have to use all of the tools at your, uh, at your disposal. So we'll do the summary now. Um, obviously, when you, there are three phases that we talked about today. First is design. When should you use Reactor? The answer is certainly not always. Um, we think it's really, really great for things that involve networking specifically, but anything that involves a lot of latency uh, or things that you have um, not quite a, a firm idea of what the total load could be, simply because it gives you all of this extra stability and all of this extra um, uh, efficiency. Obviously, you must return mono or flux. Void is not a reasonable answer, just one of those two. Uh, and then make sure you're doing reusable methods. Reusable functional methods come in so much in handy. Uh, we'll put up the, the, the GitHub repository that we use. And please, you know, if, you, if you have any questions, you can ask us directly now. Um, or take a look at our code. Um, yesterday, I was quite proud that um, during Stefan's session, he pointed at our code base as a pretty perfect example of how to use uh, or how to do reactive programming. It makes me feel great that, that we, we get that kind of praise. Next, um, when it comes time to do implementations of your APIs, remember that one of the big values that a reactive framework gives you, whether it is Reactor or if it's RxJava or anything that you, you choose, is this idea that instead of you having to manage the threading model, which has proven over the last decade to be uh, fraught 
I think is a, is a good fra uh, phrase for it. Now all of a sudden you can just define the relationship between operations. Operation A sequentially comes after operation B and in parallel with operation C. And once you've done that, the framework can very efficiently and correctly, which I think is the big issue, um, coordinate and orchestrate those for you. Uh, finally, conditional logic. Built in, probably the easiest way to handle errors or non-values are to use reactor constructs and reactor operators. However, fall back to imperative logic, especially because we have this thing where when your method is executed, when it builds the flow that you're going to use, that's not at runtime necessarily, right? It happens beforehand and the decision is made so that when subscription happens, it, it executes efficiently without even potentially having that logic inside of it. And then finally, testing. Uh, traditionally, because we see asynchronous um, flows all the time, testing is very fraught. I will be the first to say that um, I thought I had our tests all sewn up and then realized one day that, no, that should have failed, and then actually sorted it out and dealt with the threading issues and realized we had 400 failures we had no idea about. It's just like, that's not one of my best days as a programmer. <laughs> uh, and then finally, here at the end. If you are a consumer of the API, and certainly if you are a designer of an API, you should be very concerned about the consumers, and you should help them. This is going to be new for you. It's new for everybody. Help them. Warn them about things like countdown latches in tests and in main methods or, or situations where processes die before threads do. Use blocking flows, but only very, very sparingly. Be very, very careful. I cannot stress this enough. So many users of the CF Java client are just block, 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 block. And everything that we aimed to give them, all of this goodness that a reactive API could be giving them, they just lost it all. So while there are places, be very, very judicious with their use. Remember to handle errors. Um, the Dataflow project builds on top of CF Java client, and we help those guys a lot. And almost every single time that they've had a problem, it's because there was an exception being thrown that they didn't do anything with. They just used consume. It's called consume now. It used to be called subscribe. And they only handled the success case. And they didn't handle the error case. But because errors are a first class citizen in Reactor and in reactive uh, programming, you all, almost always should handle them both at all times, right? Unless you just want to silently forget that an error happened. We all know programmers like that. Um, <laughs> you should absolutely be handling them. Use composable methods and use point-free style with those. Give it a go. If it's not your thing, that's fine. My code base will be like that, but yours is what you want it to be. And so finally, there's a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Okay. And so finally. Um, Take a look at the project, the CF Java client. Obviously, pay attention to Reactor. We're quite, pr quite proud of what we've done. If you happen to be someone who needs to orchestrate Cloud Foundry, we're happy to hear from you. Um, use it as an example. Use it as uh, inspiration. And just let us know how it goes. Thank you all. Uh, questions? Yeah. Exactly. So. RX, the question is, instead of RxJava, you'd use Reactor. So both of them expose reactive programming models. Reactor is sort of a next generation of RxJava. It's slightly more limited. They, they, we haven't implemented all the same operators as RxJava. But on the other hand, there's a lot of stuff that has gone into um, Reactor that isn't in RxJava from sort of performance and efficiency and uh, this thing internally called Fusion that like really does great things if you're all on a single thread. The lead of RxJava is a heavy contributor to Reactor as well for things that beyond sort of the underlying foundation, like how does map work or how does AMB work. All of that stuff is actually, because it's sort of reactive programming model, shared between both projects. And then it's just the underlying plumbing where we make different choices. And then uh, one of the questions of what actually happens, like when I call like, subscribe, is that actually essentially like saying new thread and then like, I mean, is that, that sort of how it's working? Right, so the question is, when you call dot .subscribe, does it create a new thread for you? And the answer is no. Um, the, one of the great things about Reactor is it makes no judgments, fundamentally, excuse me, about the threading model that you would use. And so you'll see in like a lot of the examples that we had that were main methods, we had this dot .subscribe on, and then we pass a scheduler to it. And that's because if we hadn't done that, it would have just executed in one thread, because we haven't said, use a different thread. 
right? So you can say, oh, I want to subscribe on, or oh, I want to publish on. So like, you can either say, as soon as it goes to subscribe, create a new thread and do everything above that. Alternately, you could say publish on, which basically means get all the way up to the top of that and then start publishing back down. So basically, the up is on the main thread and then down is on a different thread. And, fun and what you actually see in um, CF Java client is all of the request pathway, everything going out, happens on whatever thread it was originally on because none of that stuff should be blocking at all. But then, as soon as it pops over the network, the response from the network comes in on a different thread. Uh, yes, it would be blocking. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And but, so, so there is an implication about threading. Uh, there, you get to make the choice whether that's something you want to do or not. And generally, because reactive programming models for a micro benchmark of do these 10 things sequentially in a single thread, every single time, a reactive programming model, whether it's Reactor or RxJava or anything else, even in Node, it's going to be slower than if you'd just done it imperatively. But you're not aiming for that level of performance. You're aiming for other things at that point. So if you get into a situation where you think the sort of the your flow is too slow because it blocks on subscribe, it may mean that subscribe is the incorrect choice, and maybe even reactive is the incorrect choice at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, effectively, there is no real difference. The, the, the big thing is that one works on mono, so uh, the otherwise is a mono construct, and switch is on fluxes. So under the covers, there's a whole lot of different things happening. But at your level, it, it's just a different language to kind of signify, oh, I'm on a flux, or oh, I'm on a mono. No, it is not implicitly a mock. I happen to create a method called verify that uh, because I didn't want you to have to do latch.await, right? So it happens to sit at the end, and in addition to awaiting on the latch, it also verifies that you didn't get any exceptions you didn't want to get. It fundamentally behaves the same way as the verify method in Mockito or something like that. The goal is, well, we may have had a bunch of assertions, but did everything we expect to happen and not happen? when we get to this point, which is why I reuse the word for it, because verify that everything happened and everything did not happen as expected. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, in fact. Um, the, that sort of decorator pattern kind of thing is really, really useful. It's basically map, 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 map in a row. And you can, rather than registering them with some, some central repository and you don't know exactly what it is or what order they're going in, it allows you to basically explicitly encode do this. But even better than that, even better than what I think is the readability improvement that you get there is the idea of back pressure. If one of those steps is taking too much time, it's not continuing to sort of churn in data from the other side. The request won't proceed up any further, won't request more data until this slow actor in the chain is, starts releasing data. And that's really one of the, the, the greatest benefits of it's, it's difficult to say of reactive programming because not all reactive programming has this concept of back pressure, but all sort of modern, modern reactive frameworks have this idea of back pressure that it's not simply, I am going to push this down on you as quickly as I can. There's a, I can take 64 elements, give me 64, and when I'm done with them, I'll request another 64 and then another 64. And there's some aggressive caching to make sure that like, when you get to 63, it makes sure that there's, you know, it fills up again kind of thing, or maybe it's, when you get to, I don't know, down to 63 and 128, it'll request another 63. You should never go over. Um, but this idea that um, you aren't subject to someone else deciding how quickly you can perform, you are opting in to your actual performance level instead. And that really works well in a decorator pattern. <laughs> Right. 
Yeah, indeed. So the question is, do we have things for atomicity and transactionality? To some extent, the things that you are calling manage those. So if you're calling like a JPA repository from Spring Data or something, transaction, transactionality is managed there. Beyond that, I think the, the Spring 5, the people working on Spring 5 and bringing reactiveness to it um, are going to approach that. Uh, one of the really interesting things about our implementation, being a Spring guy from the old days, is there's no Spring in it, actually. Everything we talked about today is just like Reactor and Java on top of it. And so to some extent at the Reactor level is the wrong place to deal with that. We're talking about programming model, coordination of threading, and things like that. We've built an API that doesn't require transactionality, but you start going up to the Spring level where that is a concern. We're, we're not building like a general application framework, and Spring is that, and so they take care of it. Yeah, no worries. So we need to finish now. Yep. Um, we will be hanging out outside. If anybody has any more questions, please come and see us. We'll be happy to help you. Thanks very much for coming Thanks. along.